It's said that history is written by the winners. But who are the winners? Which victories matter to the public at large? Which don't? And who should get credit for those victories? Should it be the soldiers who fought and died? The officers who gave commands? Or the celebrity general that showed up in the last second after abandoning his original army in a totally different continent after getting them stranded in a half-cocked boondoggle who then proceeds to take over the entire government? This is no one as competent, the premier podcast of all the foibles and follies of history. I'm your host, Jay, and I'm so glad you joined us today. If you want to reach out to us, you can do so at nooneiscompetent at gmail.com, or on Twitter at jaharius48 and at Azalea Wyatt. Our music is done by the legendary Sam Bryce. And before we get into a show with no sponsors, adverts, or deep state funding, Please take a moment to leave a review on the Apple Podcasting app, subscribe to us on YouTube, or do whatever the listening medium of your choice allows you to do. We deeply appreciate it. And by we, I mean I, myself, as well as my lovely co-host Azalea. Jay, are, are you ready? Are you prepared for the zero effort Azalea <laughs> recording? Perhaps. Folks. I, I did write the intro to this one, and I might write an outro, but, like, we, we're... the I will give less effort during this record. I contributed nothing to the research and structure of this, and I am going to be contributing very little to its recording. I'll edit it. I'll render it. But, but I am phoning it in right now, okay? It is currently 4.23 on a Sunday. Uh, I am watching a uh, Smash Melee tournament in another tab. Uh, I've got like 40 minutes of Adderall left in my blood before uh, we, we I just kind of start to go limp. And because of that Smash Melee tournament, I, which I will be watching this entire evening... I might just start drinking, like, within the next hour, because I expect to be very slammered by the time the night is done, because I want to, to go to sleep uh, early, so I can wake up early and have a nice attack on the Monday morning. You know, you're only an alcoholic if you go to the meetings, Jay. Yep, and that's how it works. Anyways, so you know, the sources that we'll be using for this episode are The Wars of the French Revolution, 1792-1801, to by Charles J. Asdale, and The French Revolutionary Wars by Gregory Fremont Barnes. Yes, folks, this is a uh, normal episode of the, well, there's your... <laughs> I just co-opt, I just co-opt a different podcast. God. <laughs> I I I I have just I have like some fucking I th- th- I'm editing all of this out. Okay, today on Chapo Trap House. Yes. Uh, welcome to uh, delete this with uh, Hank and Car- and his wife. Uh, welcome to the argument. Welcome to Death in the West. Welcome to what to to to. Uh, call her daddy. What's what's Joe Rogan's thing called? It's the Joe Rogan Experience. Okay, yeah, yeah, we can. Feel have like you, we have can you li- have you ever? Do you know what Call Her Daddy is? No, it's like I don't. it's like one of the top five most popular podcasts. It's very popular with women. I've never heard of it. Well, you're out of touch, and I'm out of time. So, <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, this is a normal episode of No One Is Competent, where we talk about a a war, a, a French war, because uh, we are going to be doing this for. Jay, are we like halfway through after well, this? Well, we got like... Probably yeah, not. So, probably a little less than halfway. It depends on how... We, we're going to have to do Haiti, aren't we? We're going to have to do Haiti. Probably going to have to do Spain as a separate one. Yeah, so like... We got a while left to go. God bless. Anyway, yes, uh, there is a war. There is uh, history. There's going to be uh, stuff. We get to go to Egypt. 
But the War of the Second Coalition is weird. Like, the if the First Coalition is like the Forgotten War, you know, third and fourth for like the classic, uh, this one is like, this, this is the Three Stooges episode. Like, this is the fuck up. This is the weird one. Yeah. Yeah, man. You know, as you can probably guess by now, the subject of today's episode is the War of the Second Coalition, as well as the events that lead into it, namely the French invasion of Egypt. As this is our fourth episode on revolutionary France, we'll be skipping quite a bit of the background information here. If you'd like to know more about the revolution, the directory, Napoleon Bonaparte, and why France was fighting seemingly everyone else in Europe, go listen to those previous episodes. Those would be number 27, 28, 29, and 31 first. Yeah, like, so, you know, you may say, oh, this episode's really short. Maybe it won't be short. Maybe I'll just, like, waffle uh, drunkenly and, and, and meanderingly on the mic for, like, 45 minutes in the middle of this episode. But I, I the doc is short for this one. But the reason this episode can be a little shorter is because we put all the most of the background information in the other episodes. So we still get credit. <laughs> and we're going to pick up properly in 1797. Okay, that is the end of the War of the First Coalition. At this point, France is coming out of a war where they were on the brink of defeat at many points during that conflict. But a combination of structural reforms, capable leadership, and a lack of unity amongst France's enemies resulted in a clear French victory. The treaties that ended the conflict affirmed French control over Belgium and the left bank of the Rhine River, and the creation of French-aligned republics in the Netherlands, Switzerland, and various parts of Italy. Jay, did we talk about Switzerland last time? I didn't. I didn't know they set up shit. I thought they were they were neutral and shit. Uh, the Swiss Confederation was neutral, but like, we re <laughs> we didn't really talk about it because it's complicated. But basically, like, you have like these small like uprising in the Swiss Confederation. The French do intervene. They support the Helvetic uh, Republic, and that's like the pro-French government in Switzerland. Um, and yeah, so so at the start of this, yeah, you have the Helvetic Republic in Switzerland, which is supported by France. Holy shit! If Axe beats Hungry Box, this is going to be absolutely fucking madcap. Switzerland aside, it's worth noting that Britain's war with France did not end in. 1797 the brits never uh hung up the gloves there was no longer a coalition however as their last significant ally austria made peace with france in october of 97 with the treaty of campo formio in order to defeat their last remaining enemy the french government settled on a totally feasible plan we're going to invade the British Isles themselves. And they're right over there. How hard could it be? <laughs> and we're going to put that task in the hands of our most competent star boy, who was the breakout rookie star of the last war, Mr. Napoleon Bonaparte. Now, Napoleon, by this point, was a national hero. He had defeated the British at Toulon, put down the Royalists during the 13th Vendemer, crushed the Austrians in Italy, and personally led the negotiations that brought about an end to the War of the First Coalition at Campo Formio. Fortunately for the French army, and unfortunately for our podcast, Napoleon was not a complete idiot. One good look at the state of the French navy was enough for him to tell the Directory that an invasion of Britain would be impossible. Of course, this did not mean that Napoleon would consign himself to a peacetime life. War was Napoleon's stage, and if a suitable theater could not be found in Europe, he would simply create one elsewhere. The location that would ultimately be selected was one that reflected both Napoleon's ambitions and France's strategic goals, Egypt. 
You know, when we when we talk about Napoleon, he is a guy who, like, we we, we did a whole episode about him talking about his his strengths and weaknesses and his origin and what, what point and you know even mentioning that there's many things in his his early career that are. are uh, quite inglorious and you know a lot of him just you know ordering you know, firing on civilians and whatnot but he was in many ways an incredibly talented guy but we also made it clear that there's plenty of there have been many many people throughout history just as talented as napoleon who just didn't get the opportunities that, that he got yeah that being said napoleon was quite skilled and kind of masterfully rode every opportunity. He, he, he sort of took every advantage he got as far as it could possibly go, right? Yeah. And we obviously know the end of the story. We know that, that Napoleon is going to become the the leader and then emperor of France. He's going to become its, its most famous citizen. And so you kind of try to, like, retrofit it. And, and every action in Napoleon's early career you're like you, you think is like oh is he doing this because he like wants to be the leader one day and you know where where's this going does, does he know where it's going is, is does he have some sort of grand plan and like you know obviously he you you, you think no there's no way he can't have some grand that would be crazy that'd be absolutely crazy but then you see him do things like, you know, finding another war to boost his uh, his celebrity and whatnot. And you're like, well, it's not like he, he he doesn't not not have a plan. Yes. Yeah, I, I think at this point, I don't think he has it like penciled out like I'm going to become emperor of France. But I think he does have it in mind that, you know, he, he did want to potentially, you know, become one of the directors in the directory or have a position like that. So he is definitely thinking about his political ambitions, even if I don't think, you know, he's like, oh, I will be, you know, the literal emperor. Yeah, he, he's already signaled the fact that he wants to, to leave the army for politics, at least yeah. in some degree. All right, Jay, so uh, looking at a map, France, I mean, it's not super far away from Egypt, but, like, why go over there? Yeah, that's a pretty good question. You know, we've talked a lot about a lot of the places, you know, in our various previous episodes. I don't think we've ever mentioned Egypt. And, you know, indeed, the French invasion of Egypt sticks out as a bizarre chapter in the casual reading of the Revolutionary Wars for that reason. Egypt in the late 1700s was nominally under the control of the Ottoman Empire, but in practice, the local Mamluk ruling caste exercised a great deal of autonomy. Yeah, th this is the part of history where the Ottoman Empire is not like fully collapsed, but a lot of places, their, their rule is vibe-based, as yeah, the Zoomers would so. say. Yeah, if you think of like the you know, like the Barbary states who will fight a war with America around this time period, like they're basically just running their own show, um, even though they're technically a part of the Ottoman Empire. But yeah, neither the Ottomans nor the Mamluks had joined in the wars against France. In fact, the Ottoman Empire had a history of good relations with France stretching back to the 16th century. As the proposal to launch an invasion of Egypt came from Napoleon, it's sometimes common to attribute it to his own personal ideas of glory and grandeur, a desire to recreate the actions of Alexander the Great and Augustus Caesar. As we went into on our episode that was more geared to the uh, personality of Napoleon, I believe that was 31, N Napoleon is a weeb of his time, okay? He's a fucking classics nerd, and he sees himself as a potential next Alexander the Great, next Julius Caesar, next whatever the fuck. And he's now going to, you know, the, honestly, 
He's on that Sigma grind set. Like, he's not going to let his dreams be memes. Like, he's actually <laughs> fucking Ash Ketchum going to the Pokemon League. He's, like, going to go do it. Uh, and, and I kind of respect it. But that doesn't mean that it's uh, a, a, shall we say, momentous or uh, glorious desire. It, it, it's very vainglorious. It, it's very personal. Okay. This theory is backed up by the memoirs of Louis Bourin, one of Napoleon's close associates and private secretary at the time of the Egyptian campaign. Quote Bourin, The East presented a field of conquest and glory on which Napoleon's imagination delighted to brood. Europe, he said, is but a molehill. All the great reputations have come from Asia. Napoleon was also likely motivated by the desire to fervor his reputation and temporarily distance himself from the Machiavellian nature of directory politics. Many in the directory had already begun to fear Napoleon's rise, and he did not yet have the political support to challenge them directly. Remember from last time, uh, this is like, you know, around like 95, 96, Napoleon is interfering to break up crowds and protect the directory obviously he wants to be in power but he can't like make it obvious you know yeah it, it, politics is pro wrestling you got to sell the kayfabe you got to make it look good and he's trying to give himself a little bit of a buffer and remind people that he's a military general which people like and not a politician which people don't like to quote the prominent revolutionary Germain de Stael, Napoleon had good reason to want to make himself the stuff of poetry rather than leave himself exposed to Jacobin tittle-tattle. That being said, it's worth remembering that Napoleon in 1798 was not yet dictator of France. The proposal may have been Napoleon's, but the directory had to agree to it. To explain why they did, one has to look at the broader geopolitical situation of the era. By the 18th century, France's borders were no longer limited to Europe alone. Yeah, this is something that we haven't really talked about in the previous episodes, just because there is a lot to talk about, but... They got a whole ass empire out there, right? <laughs> yeah. They're fucking yeah, doing the France, slavery and the, the, the genocide and the, the, the cultural destruction and, and all that shit we mostly blame on the British. Fr French are yeah. balls deep in that shit. <laughs> yeah. You know, they had lost the bulk of their overseas empire at the end of the Seven Years' War, but they still had various holdings in the Caribbean, Africa, and India. By 1798, though... No. They have holdings in the Caribbean for now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. By, by 98, yeah, it's not exactly in the best of shape. Their most significant possession, the colony of Saint-Domingue, was in the midst of an ongoing... <laughs> ongoing... <laughs> There's no, sometimes you can kind of predict what's going to trip you up, but there's, there's no fucking rhyme or reason to it. Yeah. Their most significant possession, the colony of Saint-Domingue, was in the midst of an ongoing slave rebellion, which, again, will get its own episode because it's very fascinating. Very, very important as well. Yeah. And the rest of France's possessions had mostly been picked off by the British during the War of the First Coalition. Napoleon's decision to invade Egypt was thus sold as a strategic overseas project. Not only would it provide France with a significant foreign possession, one that would compensate for the loss of France's older colonies, but it could also be used as a springboard for further conquest into the Middle East and even threaten Britain's newly growing wealth in India. Napoleon went so far as to propose that, quote, having occupied and fortified Egypt, we shall send a force of 15,000 men from Suez to India to join the forces of Tipu Shahib and drive away the English. Uh, Tipu Shahib is the Sultan of Mysore. He was a very powerful Indian prince who had pro-French views. J just to sort of talk shop for a second, Jay, like, I sort of think of European uh, colonialism as having two very, very broad stages. There's like the, and this is kind of a 
American centric uh, point of view, but there's like the like you know for late 1400s to 1800 like exploration and early days, lots of fuck ups uh, stages. And then there's like the 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 like mid 1800s to mid 1900s like scramble for Africa like go absolutely abominable shit that like spans more of the entire globe and like yes. you know sets up states and we're right you know maybe I'm dumb for for splitting it up like that maybe it's it, but 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 that, you know that's how I see it. We're kind of in a weird in-between section right now at the turn of uh, the century. This is not a period people kind of think of as like a French colonial or, or really colonial in general power period. Mostly because Europe is about to go nuts, uh, drowning themselves in a few decades of wars before they all kind of agree to make up and then turn their eyes to raping the rest of the world. Yeah, no. Actually, um, that idea of it having like two phases for European imperialism is actually very common. And a lot of people have like the age of colonialism versus age of imperialism, though that can be a little bit misleading. But yeah, it is very common to divide up, you know, before the late 1700s, it's mostly focused on the Americas and, as opposed to Asia. And a lot of like colonialism, we think of just like going and setting up colonies and whatever. And after around 1800, you have a big focus on Asia and eventually Africa and like taking over these old great powers. And the French invasion of Egypt is often cited as one of the things that's like an early example of that latter stage of imperialism. Well, one of the big dis distinctions between those two phases is industrialization, right? Like the reason yeah. that Britain and, and whatnot don't colonize Africa until the 1800s. It's, it's, not, it's not out of the goodness of their hearts previously. It's because they couldn't. <laughs> it was hard. Yeah. Uh, the, the powers in Africa were very strong, and it was an incredibly hostile place to try and, and literally get people to. You know, you know, All of your shit broke, and then all of your dudes died from disease. Yeah. Uh, and industrialization was what gave... Uh, the the tech the, the the massive tech tree disparity difference that allowed uh, Europe to so easily lock down other parts of uh, the globe and, and while we're on the cusp of that that has not happened yet no we're not there yet you know this is the industrial revolution has not occurred for these reasons and more, the idea to conquer Egypt and use it as a launching point for an Asian empire had been floating around the French government since before the revolution even began. You know, this went back to like the Ancien Regime. The director has also likely welcomed the prospect of sending a potential political rival away from France for a few years. And because of all of this, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Talleyrand, who is a very interesting guy, we'll Hopefully, talk yeah, about yeah. In kind, of, kind of tuck that dude into the back uh, pocket <laughs> yeah. of your brain, and we'll we'll get to him later. Yeah, yeah. He he supports Napoleon's plan, and the decision to make Egypt the next area of French expansion was agreed upon by early 1798. While the Egyptian invasion thus had genuine strategic goals, the overall plan was rife with assumptions and expectations. Assumption number one, as the British had withdrawn most of their ships from the Mediterranean when Spain switched sides and allied with France a few years earlier, Napoleon viewed the chance of British naval intervention to be fairly low. Secondly, direct intervention on the part of the Ottomans was also seen as being unlikely, as the Mamluks effectively governed Egypt as an independent country and had a history of rebelling against the Turkish Ottomans. Even if the Ottomans intervened, it was assumed that they would just, you know, sweep over them pretty easily as well. Finally, Talleyrand potentially thought that Austria and Russia would be tempted to join in, or at least give their tacit approval to a war against their historic enemy, the heathen Turks. Of course, we'll see in due time if these assumptions come to pass. Uh, the Russia thing is absolutely way off. Like, 
the, the <laughs> Russians see uh, the 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 eastern coast of the Mediterranean and the Balkans 100% is the place they want to take. Like they 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 100% have their eyes on Con- Constantinople in this period. Uh, they're chomping at the bit to get it. There's no way they would want the French anywhere close to to that. <laughs> no. Yeah, like there was a lot of talk whenever they would go to war that like they're going to the war for, you know, Christian Europe against the, yeah. the evil, you know, Muslims. But like, Yeah, that that was yeah, they, uh, they, they wanted Constantinople. Yeah, well well I mean for for years that was Russia's line is that we are the defenders yeah. of Christianity uh in the East. And that that is that is our role. On May 10th, 1798, the French army of Egypt set sail from Toulon with around 35,000 men and carried aboard 400 transports, which were escorted by 13 ships of the line and four frigates. Napoleon launched his invasion with, in a characteristic fashion, stating to the men that, quote, Soldiers, the eyes of Europe are upon you. You have great destinies to fulfill. Traveling alongside Napoleon's soldiers were hundreds of scientists, historians, and archaeologists, a part of a scheme to present the invasion as a sort of armed academic mission. Interest in ancient Egypt was already on the rise in Europe, and the actions of these experts and their findings would lead to an explosion in Western Egyptomania, as it was called. This is uh, when the Rosetta Stone is going to get found, right? Exactly, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it, it's probably worth noting historically, like, archaeology and paleontology are, are not super a formal thing at this point in history. No. <laughs> but, like, 50, 70 years from now, they will be. And this is kind of where the proto versions of, of that are, are getting uh, underway. The turn of the 18th century is a very fascinating time in, uh, sci- science, in the history of science. It's also an early example of the close relationship that these fields will have with imperialism. And, you know, like you're talking about, like, the different kinds of imperialism and flavors. One which we'll see more going forward is imperialism that is backed up by the idea of, like, scientific discovery. Like, learning about these places and their history and nature and everything like that. And this, again, like, is one of the first examples of that. So, how did this invasion go? Well, actually, it went really well. The British had caught wind of Napoleon's plans and sent a fleet of 14 ships of the line and seven frigates under the command of Vice Admiral Horatio Nelson to patrol the Mediterranean. But the French managed to elude being spotted by the English and even conquered Malta from the Knights Hospitaller along the way. Napoleon's fleet reached Egypt on July 1st and swiftly conquered Alexandria before marching on Cairo. My understanding is that there's sort of a, like, Tom and Jerry or Scooby-Doo-esque uh, series of episodes with the French and the British in the Mediterranean. Oh, yeah, where the British will show up, like, je- like a, two days after they've left. Yeah, it, it, it was very cat and mouse. There was a lot of like back and forth, which we were kind of just glossing over. But yeah, it was uh, not a guarantee that the French would go unspotted. But they kind of took a weird route through it in order to yeah. sort of shake them off, keep them guessing. Now, en route to Cairo, the French encountered their first serious opposition, a Mamluk army of some 21,000 men strong. The resulting battle, which is known to history as the Battle of the Pyramids, due to it occurring within eyeshot of the Pyramids of Giza, was an overwhelming French victory. Even though the two sides were roughly equal in numbers, the Mamluks took over 5,000 casualties and were forced to retreat. The French only suffered a few hundred losses. Now, is this mostly a uh, technological advantage or like a flanking advantage or, or what went down? It, it, it's kind of both. A lot of it was just like the French formed squares um, to resist Mamluk cavalry charges and, you know, kind of just showed that like his sort of mass cavalry charges were no longer super effective against disappointed infantry. Cool. So yeah, it's, it's a bit of both. 
Things would turn against the French just days later, when Horatio Nelson, that British admiral, finally discovered the main French fleet at anchor in Abakir Bay near Alexandria. Nelson devised a plan to surround the French by maneuvering his ships both seaward and landward of their fleet. And while this was dangerous maneuvering due to the risk of being grounded, it worked perfectly, and on August the 1st, the British destroyed the French f fleet at the Battle of the Nile. You can um, take a shot every time uh, we say the British destroyed the French fleet uh, <laughs> in the next dozen episodes or so. Uh, sinking two ships of the line, capturing a fervor nine. Fun little rhyme there. Napoleon's army of Egypt is now well and truly trapped in Egypt. And as we learned from our Crusades episode uh, many, many moons ago, getting from Egypt back to France over land, not a fun time. Not a fun time at all. In spite of this defeat at sea, Napoleon was able to keep the morale of his soldiers on land high, using the fact that retreat was not an option to spur them into further action. <laughs> Napoleon himself was initially quite pleased with his invasion, stating, In Egypt, I found myself free from the obstacle of an irksome civilization. It was full of dreams. I saw myself founding a religion. Marching on into Asia, riding an elephant, a turban on my head. And in my hand, the new Koran that I would have composed to suit my needs. Just felt the need to do a super racist, bad <laughs> French accent there. But like, this is a man literally be like, yeah, so I'm just going to be the next like Alexander the Great and Prophet Muhammad in one Totally a grounded, cool guy who we should idolize <laughs> and, and, and make the, the, the big dude of our, our, our nation. Yeah. That's that's 100% head firmly on his shoulders there. Yep. Now, of course, Napoleon was intelligent enough to keep such talk of founding new religions to himself. Ostensibly, he portrayed the French as the liberators of Egypt, freeing the people from, alternatively, the Mamluk or Turkish yoke. You know, our, our old favorite, you know, they'll treat us as liberators uh, idea. <laughs> they say it every single time. And the <laughs> amount of times it's true. Zero. So far. Yeah. He was clear to instruct his men to respect the Islamic faith, and he did go out of his way to win the support of religious leaders. Some of Napoleon's men even converted to Islam, most notably General Jacques-Francois Minot, who took up the name Abdullah de Minot. Huh. That's kind, of, that's, of that's their, kind of interesting. Yeah, it was pretty neat to read about. <laughs> but yeah. In spite of their efforts, this PR blitz was met with only limited success at best. Some Egyptians did support the French. Several members of the Coptic Christian minority joined the new French administration, for example. However, the vast majority of Egyptians remained neutral or actively opposed to the foreign invaders. British propagandists b began distributing pamphlets across Egypt, stating that, quote, the French people are a nation of stubborn infidels and unbridled rascals. They look upon the Quran, the Old Testament, and the New Testament as fables. If it pleases God, it is reserved for you to preside over their entire destruction, as dust is scattered by the wind. For those of y'all who aren't aware, uh, there are a lot of Christians in Egypt, uh, even today, especially today, actually. But the vast majority yeah. of them are, are Coptic, which is an offshoot of, Orf of Eastern Orthodox uh, Christianity. So these guys are going to be uh, very unfamiliar to the Catholic and even the Protestant uh, Christians uh, that the French are bringing over. So if you think there's going to be, oh, they'll relate that way, eh, not necessarily. Yeah. 
Anti-French sentiment erupted in October 1798 with a massive revolt in Cairo against French rule. This revolt was put down by force, but along with continued resistance to the French in Upper Egypt it showed that Napoleon's dreams of a quick victory were not likely to come to pass. So they held Cairo for like three months? Yeah, I mean, they, they you know, they put down the revolt, like, by killing thousands of people, and they'll hold it again for, you know, a few more years. But, yeah, it was, the people were not exactly pleased. It is here that we'll turn from Egypt to the events in Europe, where an uneasy peace prevailed. Austria wanted revenge for the terms of Campo Formio. This is just a year later. While the Russians, who had set out the War of the First Coalition, were now alarmed with what they saw as French expansion in the Eastern Mediterranean, which we already mentioned is what they see as, like, their territory, even though, like, they don't have it. They just, like, have it in their head. Because, you know, they're dumb autists. I, I say as a dumb autist. They have the, they have the, 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 the do it for her poster on the wall with a just pictures of constantinople they they have they have um you know it's that thing where like you call dibs on it but you call dibs on it in your head yeah (laughs) but but you know you think you're the main character of the world and everyone should read your mind and play along to your whims (laughs) classic example of of overprivileged and under mature Meanwhile, in Switzerland, an uprising against the pro-French Helvetic Republic was brewing. The seeds for a new alliance were being sown, and following the French defeat defeat in the Nile, negotiations began for the formation of the Second Coalition in late 1798. This coalition would comprise chiefly of Britain, Austria, Russia, and the Ottoman Empire. I want to very notably point out that Prussia is not in this game so all these guys besides britain are like kind of far further away from france itself yeah now as the powers of europe plotted against france napoleon remained in egypt the french had hoped that the ottoman government in constantinople would be willing to give up egypt perhaps for some minor payment or concessions Uh, They had taken a few of the islands that the Venetians had um, at the end of the War of the First Coalition, and they thought maybe they could trade those for Egypt. Instead, however, the Ottoman Sultan, who was supported by the British, committed his forces to driving the French out of the Middle East. Rather than simply waiting to be attacked, Napoleon responded by launching a new offensive into the Levant and Syria, invading the region with an army of 13,000 men. The French capture of Jaffa in early March 1799 and laid siege to Acre at the end of that month. By this point, the French had shown themselves to be clearly superior to the Ottomans in open battle. However, a new enemy began to take its toll on Napoleon's men, disease. Ah, disease. The, <laughs> the, the classic thing that, ki- that kills 80% of the casualties of, like, every war that humanity has ever fought. Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the old faithful bubonic plague broke out amongst the French garrison in Jaffa and quickly spread. Gotta love a classic. Got, got, <laughs> you, you know, the, the, its best days might have been... Uh, the, the bubonic plague's best days might have been behind it. But you put it on the field and it will perform, goddammit. That's, that, that's commitment that you don't get from these young Zoomer diseases. Yeah. And then the French forces surrounding Acre soon found themselves suffering from the disease as well. Acre was very well defended and supported at sea by the Royal Navy, which made a quick assault on it impossible. After two months of siege, the French would be forced to withdraw. Yeah, in order to like stop bubonic plague from spreading, you you like you need hard distance of uh, one yeah. person from another and and a military camp. Uh, that's not gonna happen. Also, I love Acre as like a name for a city because like it's pretty great. You you, yeah. you, you just like never believe that it's real. Or, like 
Wait. Who, who, how, how the fuck, why is there a place named Acre? Wait, there's, there's absolutely no, who would name a, 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 a place Acre? Who the fuck would name a place in, in Palestine Acre? Well, a bunch of dumbass crusaders, but that's story for another day. Anyway, Acre represents arguably the first significant defeat in Napoleon's career. But remember, it's to disease rather than, um, you, you know, defeat on the battlefield. So he can kind of uh, stash that L under the desk. He had faced setbacks in earlier campaigns, but they were never more than temporary. Acre put an end to Napoleon's eastern dreams. In 1805, he would state that if he had captured the city, that, quote, I would have made my soldiers into a sacred battalion, my immortals. I would have finished the war against the Turks with Arabic, Greek, and Armenian troops. Instead of a battle in Moravia, I would have won a battle of Issus. I would have made myself emperor of the East, and I would have returned to Paris by way of Constantinople. He says that quote while he is emperor of France. <laughs> it's like, yeah. like that's not enough. And and to like hit on the whole like classic Swede thing, he's making multiple references in that quote. The sacred battalion is to the sacred battalion of Thebes. The immortals refers to the immortals of the Persian Empire, and the Battle of Issus was one of Alexander's great victories. This dude is, this guy is like Elon Musk. Like, he's clearly infinitely insecure and will not be happy no matter what he gets. Anyway, Napoleon was forced to retreat back to Egypt, his army now numbering 7,000 able men from its starting point at 13,000. Even with these reduced forces, he was able to see off further Ottoman attacks, but events in Europe would soon draw his attention away from the Orient. 13,000 men is not a lot of guys to, like, invade a whole-ass fucking country across the sea with. That's, no. I, I, that's, that's, that's loose. That's scuffed. By the way, Jay, <laughs> yeah. can, can we agree that, like, short-term, Twitter is way better now that Elon Musk owns it? It's like, probably not long-term. I mean, maybe. It's not like the previous administration was particularly great. But, like... It's been really funny. <laughs> the content of the sm the smell of the flames of the hell site have had a, a a sweetness to their acrid uh sting recently. It's 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 been quite nice. Yeah. When 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 Elon tries to invade Acre with like 50 SpaceX employees, oh I'll enjoy that. God, I hope this podcast goes on for long enough to, long enough for us to make the Elon Musk episode. <laughs> like we like to yeah. do the end of the story, so might be a while, but I would I would be honored to tear into that ass hat. All right, yeah. so like uh, fucking. 56 minutes on my time uh, into recording uh let's get into the war of the second coalition <laughs> yeah the war of the second coalition in europe began in earnest with the russo-austrian offensive into switzerland and northern italy this campaign was led by alexander suvorov a veteran of russia's wars against poland and the ottoman empire Suvorov was known for his propensity for quick movements and aggressive tactics, skills he displayed to a great effect in Italy. Uh, there's a fun quote from Suvorov, which is like, the bullet's a fool, but the bayonet's a friend. Basically, he's the kind of guy who, like, he'll exchange, you know, he'll have his men exchange, like, around. Get in there, damn it! Immediately <laughs> charge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's, uh, that, that's like the damn the torpedoes before damn the torpedoes right there. Yeah. <laughs> By the summer of 1799, his 65,000 strong army had inflicted several defeats on the French, forcing them out of Milan, Naples, Turin, and Mantua, and effectively reversing all of their victories of the years prior. Further coalition forces under General Korsakov and the Austrian general Friedrich von Hutze 
inflicted similar defeats on the French and their Helvetic allies in Switzerland. Thus, by mid-1799, a large coalition army stood poised to invade southern France. Pause for a moment. Russia is, you know, everyone knows that Russia is utterly embarrassed. It, it, like, you know, 60 years from now, Russia is going to start looking like an incredibly limp, limp and pathetic uh, power on the, uh, the, the world stage for a while yeah. uh, until the revolution. But... You know, they just had Catherine, who was a very powerful modernizing uh, leader, and and this is we're we're still in some of the good years of the Russian Empire right now. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, Catherine. I think you make a fair argument for being the Russia's the, best historical the goat. leader. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Suvorov has a better logistical chain than the modern <laughs> Russian army. All right, all right. That's not not, not the best, uh, not, not the hardest of hurdles to to step over. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty amusing oh. now. But yeah, no, Russia is you know it's a serious power. But it is at this crucial moment that France will be saved once again by the disunity and incompetence of their enemies. You see, the Austrians and Russians deeply distrusted each other. Austria, at this point, you know, they thought, you know, we've beaten the French, we're going to win this war. So their main worry is that the Russians would now dominate northern Italy, an area which was traditionally a part of the Habsburg sphere of influence. The Russians, meanwhile, suspected that the Austrians were just using them to win new lands for the Habsburg monarchy. The British, too, had issues with their erstwhile allies. Austria had been unable to repay debts owed to Britain from the War of the First Coalition, and thus the British cut off all subsidies to the Habsburgs. This was a problem because Austria was very deeply in debt. The Royal Navy, meanwhile, prowled the waters around Europe, stopping and inspecting merchant vessels suspected of trading with France, an act that enraged the Russians who saw it as an infringement on their sovereignty and as a British attempt at dominating the North and Baltic Seas. It was thus at this moment, when France was in arguably her worst position militarily since 1793, that the Austrians made the decision to slow the coalition advance by sending a large chunk of their forces up the Rhine, thereby weakening the coalition position in Switzerland. Suvorov no longer had enough men to advance towards France, and the French, meanwhile, were strengthening their army in the area under the command of General André Massina. So the French are, are moving their army down to counter the force yes. that's going to invade the south. Yeah. And the Austrians are kind of like just moving around, kind of weakening their positions with the Russians and stuff like that. And obviously it's it's kind of hard for the Austrians and the Russians to link up with the Swiss because it's fucking Switzerland. And yeah, <laughs> it's they they are up in the mountains. Yeah, right. I mean, this is the reason that you have to go into France either through the north or the or or the south because the middle is it's not great. <laughs> so it's not great. <laughs> Meanwhile, on September twenty fifth of seventeen ninety nine, a French army of seventy five thousand men under Messina, attacked a combined Russo-Austrian force of roughly the same size, size under Korsakov and von Holtz at the Second Battle of Zurich. The French won a clear victory over the coalition, forcing them to retreat. Now, now where, where exactly is this taking place? Zurich is in, so this is in Switzerland, this is in Ah, yes. Yeah. So, so now they're gonna, that, yeah. Now they're gonna take care of that front. Yeah. So, so this major coalition, I, I don't pay too much uh, attention to the French and their cities. Uh, besides, you know, they, like they got all the Jewish gold. They're in the mountains. Uh, I've heard they're they're nice people. Each one of them learns how to speak seventeen language, but languages by the time they're six years old. W- what else do you need to know about them? Some of them didn't let women vote until like the nineteen seventies. <laughs> 
don't make an off-color joke, don't make an off-color joke, don't make an off-color joke, don't... Anyway, this major coalition defeat was soon followed by another one at Castricum in the Netherlands. In August, a combined Anglo-Russian force had invaded the pro-French Batavian Republic with an intent on destroying its naval forces and ideally capturing the entirety of the Netherlands. While the former objective had been completed, the French managed to defeat the British and Russians on land, leading to their negotiated withdrawal from the region. At Zurich and Castricum, the strength of the French army, brought about by the reforms of the previous years, really began to show. The French typically had the edge over their enemies at executing complex maneuvers, thanks to the divisional system put in place during the War of the First Coalition. And the new batch of generals who had risen to the top of those chaotic years of fighting, men like Messina, Moreau, and Brun, were skillful commanders. The coalition, meanwhile, had failed to make meaningful changes to their forces since their defeat in the first coalition. You know, this is the classic example of not taking the L, not assessing why you lost. And it's also, again, we, in episode 31, we pointed out, the most important thing, at least in the short term, to come out of the French Revolution was all those military reforms. And now those reforms yeah. have sank in and... You know, soldiers have, have been doing them for years and they're getting good. At this point now, if you have a battle which both sides are roughly equal numbers, you're going to put your money on the French because they'll typically win that battle just because they're more effective at fighting. Yeah, they, they ain't got ships and, and navy for, for dick, but they, they, they can fucking wipe the floor of anybody on, on even terrain. So, defeated in Switzerland and the Netherlands, and mistrustful of our allies, the Russians now made the decision to abandon the coalition altogether. Suvorov's men retreated through the Alps, back towards Russia, leaving Austria and Britain alone to face the French. This is like... This is kind of completely unnecessary. Like... Switzerland and the Netherlands are minor theaters of this war. You're, you're right there at France. You can still invade France. You're it's, right there. <laughs> like, the, the czar, the, this would be czar Paul was like. Yes. Kind of threw a bit of a hissy Paul. fit. <laughs> God, yeah. this, it, it, it's like Montezuma the second. Like, 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 fucking, as soon as Big Daddy or Big Mama dies, like, the, the sun is always just awful. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and, he kind of like throws a hissy fit and is like really just angry, especially at the British. Like the British will recapture Malta, for example, because, you know, the French had taken it. And like Paul was just like jealous that the British have Malta for some reason because he thought it was cool and like he wanted it. So they, like, you know, like he kind of just like throws a hissy fit and leaves. Uh, pause. Uh, so like um, is, Paul's not going to be. Uh, the Russian czar for much longer, right? No, he's going to get assassinated. <laughs> oh, yeah, okay, so we're leaving this in the episode. So, yeah, Paul, Paul's a fucking idiot, and he, he could have conquered France here, and, and because he did it, they're, 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 they're going to uh, throw his his ass out. Um, very Game of Thronesy, yeah. honestly. Like, like Paul kind of gives me Martin vibes of like the, this, you know, guy who spends his entire life in the former ruler's shadow is, is weird, is insular, is, is, you know, never really learns to be mature, have consequences or do anything of significance, but is simultaneously super close to power, but also way far away from it. And, and then gets the reins of, of the horse, uh, steers it over the cliff, and then immediately gets, like, literally stabbed in the back by the, the court, who, after a few years, is like, yeah, this, get, get, get him out. Just, just get him the fuck out. Yeah. A very effective form of government for regulating <laughs> who's in charge of the head of state. Very effective. Self-correcting. Nothing could get wrong. Nothing could go wrong. And, you know, as all of this is happening, Napoleon is still stuck in Egypt. So, Jay, let me get this straight. 
you're telling me that while France is like overcoming the odds and, and being outnumbered, but winning anyway, and, and, and turning things around and winning in Switzerland and winning in the Netherlands and at, at getting the Russians to go back home, the tail between their legs, uh, this, this was all done without the golden boy being involved at all. Yeah, like, we're stepping back slightly a few months, but yes, Napoleon's not involved in these. He's in Egypt, and then he's on a boat. <laughs> but yeah, because news was, of course, very slow to reach Egypt, and especially because the British were kind of blockading the Mediterranean. And this meant that Napoleon was not even really aware of the outbreak of fighting in Europe until well after it began. He didn't really learn about what was going on until August. Um, they were negotiating with the British for a prisoner exchange, and Napoleon asked the British commander, like, can I have some French newspapers? And they're like, okay. <laughs> and that's how he learns about what's going on. So this was before, you know, the French turned things around. So Napoleon's like, oh no, France is going to shit. I need to get out of here and go back to France. And, and that is what he does. You know, faced with you know, between what's settling into what was becoming a quagmire in Egypt and the potential defeat of France at home, Napoleon made the decision to abandon his army to its fate and sail to France on a lone frigate in the end of August. This is my favorite part. Like, we've got the three <laughs> stooges being chased after by the British in, in uh, the Mediterranean. We, we, we've got the fucking, like... Landing in Alexandria, abandoning your fleet to get destroyed, and then fucking, like, beating your head against Acre, only to pull out. A and now, glorious leader, just, just fucking dips and leaves thousands of dudes. He's just fucking starve and die in the Middle East while he goes home on his private boat. <laughs> <laughs> so, Napoleon, you know, he dips. He eventually reaches France by October 9th. By that time, France has already turned the tide of the war. So instead of fighting the Russians, Napoleon instead engages himself in overthrowing the French government in the coup of 18 Brumaire. He so just immediately overthrows the government that successfully defended the people. <laughs> Like, as we pointed <laughs> yeah. out in episode 31, the directory was, was not really involved with any of that. They were all stupid and de deserved to go. Like, what? who fucking cares? But, like, this is the guy who, who gets an A-plus on the group project despite contributing nothing. Didn't even make yeah. the PowerPoint. All right? D only like delivered like two slides of the PowerPoint did none of the research did none of the wrangling did none of the coordination didn't even host it at his house with fucking snacks like still got an A yeah. Sh absolute Chad shit <laughs> yeah I, I do like you know his successor in Egypt um, you know the guy in command after him is General Kleber and Kleber was like Oh yeah, like Napoleon's coming back. Spoiler: he he never comes back. <laughs> but yeah, for, this means that from November 1799 onwards, Napoleon is the basically the dictator of France. You know, he'll be calling the shots. Yeah, o now, until they us... get a new constitution in, in which case he will only be mostly the dictator of France. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Now, this brings us to the new century, you know, the 19th century. The withdrawal of Russia left Austria as the last major remaining continental power at war with France, but the Austrians would continue to fight on into the first year of the 19th century. The French were now on the offensive. In early 1800, Napoleon himself led them into Italy, keen on triumphing again in the country that he had made his name in just a few years prior. In May, his forces crossed through the Great St. Bernard Pass, an event that would be immortalized through the famous painting by Jacques-Louis David. Napoleon and the Austrians would meet in battle on June 14, 1800, near the town of Marengo. This is like the easiest thing to say. That's the hardest Marengo? thing. To... Marengo. 
in Piedmont. Who gives a shit? Uh, y'all y- don't, at this point, y'all don't expect any us to pronounce nothing on this podcast good. The resulting Battle of Marengo would go down as one of Napoleon's most dramatic victories, but it was, in actuality, nearly a defeat for the French. A series of French assaults on the Austrian positions were repelled, and the Austrian commander, Michel von Milaz, was even able to break the center of the French lines. That's usually curtains, but the timely arrival and employment of reserve forces by Napoleon turned the battle in his favor. At the end, the French stood triumphant, and the Austrians were forced out of Italy. This is fascinating, Jay. So, like, when he, when they broke, when the Austrians broke the, the middle of the French line, did, did Napoleon, like, uh, deploy his reserves, like, right into that break, or did he, like, f- and just shore it up, or how exactly did they turn that? Uh, par- partially shoring up the break, and also partially deploying other forces to kind of flank the, um, the Austrians. Like, he, this was a very good battle for Napoleon. We've kind of shot at him throughout this episode. He is a very good He's able to adjust. Commander. He's very good at responding to situations as they evolve on the battle. Yeah, and, you know, Marengo is very nearly a defeat for him. I think most other generals would Did they be have defeated. more troops, less troops? Was it roughly even? It's about the same. It's about... 30,000 per side. I think the French might have had slightly less, but it's roughly equal. Uh, The situation further up north was pretty similar. General Jean Moreau led the French through Switzerland to attack the Austrians along the southern Rhine. The French won a string of victories, culminating in the Battle of Hohenlinden in Bavaria on December 3rd. Now, a fun thing is Hohenlinden is as a battle, about twice as big as Marengo. Remember, Marengo is like 30,000 men per side. Hohenlinden is about 60,000 per side. (laughs) So, yeah. Yeah, with defeat inevitable, the Austrians agreed to ceasefire at the Armistice of Steyr later that month. And again, this means that you can argue that Jean Moreau had more to do with the defeat of Austria than Napoleon did. The armistice of Steyr would be followed by another armistice at Treviso in Italy, and eventually the Treaty of Lunéville in February of 1801. Lunéville essentially saw Austria accept the tre- terms of the Treaty of Campo Formio that had ended the War of the First Coalition, basically meaning that the situation was, was there, back to what that's it was before this war actually began. Actually, kind of generous from the French. Like, was there, there not the idea of of like a uh, war? Uh, uh, I ref- think the. Um, Reparations or like, uh, you know, t- taking more shit back then? Not really. Um, Campo Form, yeah, like Campo Formio was pretty generous to the French as is. In hindsight, we know that like the Austrians are going to keep on going to war with France. I think they were probably thinking, though, at the time, like, let's just go back to Campo Formio, call it a day. And not fight each other again. <laughs> yeah, and and I guess like even though they're they're now winning big, like they all they the, the it did almost go really badly for the for the French. So yeah. They're kind of like, all right, we, we we got the dub. Let's just secure the dub. Go home. Not get too greedy. Honestly, I respect it now that I think about it. Of course, throughout all these campaigns and negotiations, a chunk of the French army was still stuck in Egypt, slowly wasting away of disease, having been abandoned by Napoleon back in 1799. Two years ago! (laughs) The French in Egypt had continued to fight on under the command of General Kleber until he's stabbed by an Egyptian assassin, and then command goes to the recently converted Abdullah de Beno. I I want an anime set in this. I I want a fucking historical drama, like, like, historical fiction drama. Like, how, how many dudes just fucking, like, saw a hot uh palestinian or egyptian or turkish gal and is like fuck it i'm converting to islam and just living here yeah <laughs> like and just deserted that probably a, a non-trivial amount now it would take until 1801 for their positions to finally collapse you know that's when the combined british ottoman army took cairo and then alexandria by september 
The French adventure would come to an end with an agreement signed by Menot with the British general John Howie Hutchinson, in which the British agreed to repatriate the French army back to France in exchange for a return of Egypt back to Ottoman control. The British also made sure... Which they kind of already had. Yeah. <laughs> The British also made sure to secure all the artifacts collected by the French during their expedition for themselves as a part of the deal, which is why the Rosetta Stone, among other things, resides in London to this day. Absolute rip. (laughs) Those did not go back to Egypt. (laughs) Oh, no, 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 no. We still have have the the fucking obelisks and and all the shit. Like, the French do, do keep some of the stuff, like, oh, some of the stuff that they get out of Egypt for this agreement. You know, that's why there is a big obelisk if you go to France and go on the Champs-Élysées. You know, it's, it's actually pretty cool, but yeah. A lot of Egyptian stuff in, in France and, and Britain. Obelisks are, 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 are dope. Um, also relatively easy to uh, rip out of foreign soil as far as monuments go. Yeah. So just a slight recap, because I'm now realizing the British did not show up a lot in, like, the meat of this story, more at the beginning and the end. Yeah. Even though they were the ones who always had been kept the war going and who, like, got everybody in to start. Did they even ever deploy troops on the mainland? They took part in in the the Netherlands, right. Like, surely they had to. Yeah, they took part in in the invasion in the Netherlands, um... So they did deploy some forces. Uh, there was a very short campaign. That was only like a few months because they, they lose. And then they're like, ah, like we're going to leave. Yeah. Okay. So Britain's like the fucking gifted and talented kid who in, in the group project who, who like fucking uh, knows all of the shit, but doesn't like teach it to most of the other p- people and like doesn't actually contribute a lot yeah. to the project but everyone like assumes that the project's because of them because like they have a reputation for yeah. being smart but they actually do jack shit because like most gifted kids i could say because my entire friend grew up they're fucking moronic <laughs> by every objective measurement I mean, they they do fight in Egypt to their credit, um, but yeah, it's mostly the Royal Navy that's doing the heavy lifting, not the army. The final major action of the War of the Second Coalition in Europe would occur in April 1801 in a rather unlikely place, the waters off of Copenhagen, Denmark. Denmark had remained neutral during the conflict, but the British feared that they were preparing to ally with the French. The Danes had also joined the short-lived Second League of Armed Neutrality, an alliance led by Russia that sought to challenge Britain's imposition of a blockade around European waters. Uh, Britain responded to this uh, act of uh, neutrality and, you know, wanting nations to come together in peace uh, by launching a preemptive attack on Denmark. The Royal Navy force under Admiral Nelson destroyed and captured several Danish ships at anchor near Copenhagen because blowing up ships that aren't moving seems to be Admiral Nelson's specialty. (laughs) What a genius and forced the Danes into signing an agreement not to ally with France. The assassination of Tsar Paul I in March had, in any case, brought about the end of the League of Armed Neutrality, which was mostly his pet project. Uh, Because famously, uh, pet project uh, coalitions of nations led by Russia uh, do do, do not go particularly (laughs) well. At the end of the day, the War of the Second Coalition affirmed France's position in Europe, but showed the limits of their power abroad. Napoleon had engaged in an ultimately pointless Egyptian campaign, one that may have brought down his entire career had he not managed to escape Egypt for Europe when things began to go south. The coalition itself, however, was ultimately undermined by infighting and the lack of any singular strategic vision. 
Whereas the first coalition had lasted several years, the second began to fall apart in a matter of months. Britain would continue to remain at war with France, as they are wont to do, but the respite following 1801 would give Napoleon time to shore up his control over the French government and society. It would be the years between this conflict and the resumption of hostilities of the War of the Third Coalition that would see Napoleon achieve his political ambitions and crown himself Emperor of the French. So, Jay, what the fuck did we learn here? Yeah, uh, don't start a war in Egypt when you don't have the naval forces to back it up. And But as long as you can get out, it's actually still okay because your enemies will make a bunch of dumb decisions. This is like, you know, I can like respect a lot of like the coalition leaders during the war of the first coalition because like they fuck up in the end, but like, yeah, like Br- like Brunswick like fundamentally played a good game. It- it's like yeah. when someone loses, but like they pulled off some sick combos. Like yeah. Brunswick like made mistakes, but like fundamentally fucking good at the game. You can't backseat general in hindsight is twenty twenty. Kind of got fucked by that. Yeah, I'm like, you know, the Austrians win some notable victories in in the first coalition and stuff like that. The second coalition is when. The coalition, like, barely lasts longer than a year. Like, the Russians pull out basically in a year. Like, <laughs> and the Russians were supposed to be like, almost like the trump card. Like, oh, the first coalition, the Russians weren't involved. I mean, they're, they're by far the largest army, right? Yeah. It's fucking <laughs> Russia. <laughs> and you, and you, and and they're the ones who traveled the farthest to get over there. Yeah, and then they leave because Tsar Paul is like sad <laughs> and angry at the British. Because he's sad. And, like, this is the entire point of this fucking podcast, people. These are the... These are your heroes. These are your heads of state. Okay? Like, you, th- these are the people who are in charge. People like Tsar Paul. Again, even from that... but I, Paul wasn't ex- even acceptable by, by the standards of that time. But, like... Napoleon, who, again, did do cool things, not fully incompetent not fully stupid but like the po- supposedly the goat of land warfare just fucking lucking out after getting what 7000 men killed uh, eventually in in Egypt for no for for no gain something like that and, and, like, just gets to now be dictator of, of France because the people who hate the directory want him. It's convenient for him to be. And then he just gets to, like, uh, y- y- saunder into uh, Ita- Italy and do some curb stopping. And sure, it was, it was well fought, well played curb stopping. But, like, damn, the other French generals had to just be absolutely molding. <laughs> Yeah. Like, like maybe Napoleon was a fun guy and they they like liked him personally, but God. Uh I mean a lot of the generals and later, you know, a lot of these guys will be marshals. A fair amount of them do have, you know, a bit of a chip on their on their shoulder when it comes to Napoleon. Like some of them be- Because like are, why not like, them? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> When you get into studying politics, one of the the first things you learn when you study leaders is the concept of replacement rate. It's the par of rulers, where, like, if, if, if an average person replaced you, would it be better or worse? And, like, what these other generals are, are frustrated with is that Napoleon is getting all of this glory, but they know that they're, like, just as good. Yeah, again, like, Jean Moreau has his victory at Hohenlinden is bigger than Marengo, but like Marengo will be remembered as the great victory in this war. It's all history is, is fucking mostly just branding and lies. Uh, Never forget it. Anyway, so follow us on Twitter at (laughs) Azalea Wyatt and at Jaharis 48. 
uh, fucking, you, you know, uh, have a, have a good time, uh, pet a dog, uh, hug, hug, hug a tree, uh, do some push-ups, uh, subscribe on YouTube, you can ask us questions in the comments or suggest episodes, email us, suggest episodes, talk to me, I'm, I'm very lonely and I'm, I'm obscenely lonely, uh, fucking rate, get it, I want 10 reviews on Apple Podcasts, god damn it, we might actually have it, I haven't checked it in like, for, for forever I, I'm a very busy boy okay like I'm fucking writing books and trying to get a job and and uh, making a short film and god I fucking hate this thing at this point I've been working on the short film for way too fucking long what is even my life uh uh who who uh, Jay where the fuck am I can I can we end the podcast now are we are we done yeah okay uh I get uh, we're, I've been told we're done all right uh bye